I would like to start this talk by looking at this painting by Titian. It's called The Vendramin Family, and it's a very large painting in the National Gallery in London. There are no references to the classical world, no Neoplatonism, no humanism or reference to the mathematical advances of the age, apart from a very basic use of the eye line to make it appear as if we are kneeling with this family. And what are they kneeling before? A cross on an altar. But n not any old cross. This cross holds pieces of the true cross that Christ was crucified on. This painting is about the veneration of a relic, an almost dark age superstition. And we may ask, what has happened to the Renaissance? To answer that question, we need to look at this man here. This is again by Titian, this is Pope Paul III. The Reformation had started early in the 16th century and the Catholic Church was losing control over areas of Europe. Many in the church had sympathies with the reformers and wanted to see the Church of Rome reformed back to its original mission of representing Christ on earth. However, Popes Julius II and Leo X were not interested in change, but this Pope was. Now, Pope Paul III called for the Council of Trent, which brought, brought bishops and theologians across the church together to discuss the future of the church. It was held between 1545 and 1563. The Pope did not attend, but his representatives did, insisting that, whatever happened, Pope Paul III would not lose any power. Among the things decided at the Council was that images were and had always been an exceptional tool in the spreading of the Catholic faith. The reformers, on the other hand, had destroyed sacred images. They saw them as going against the second commandment not to make or bow down to human-made images. They destroyed much of the religious art of countries influenced by Protestantism. One of the things that is noticeable is the way they attacked the eyes. These images had looked upon the people in silent judgment. They would look down on them no more. It has to be remembered that the Reformation was, to many people, the death of a complete worldview. The medieval person had been born into a system. They knew their place in the social order. Their days and seasons were marked out by the church calendar, and they didn't have to bother themselves with the big issues in life. Their priest could do that. Jesus was disappearing before their very eyes. It needs to be said that the Renaissance was an elitist movement. It only mattered to the wealthy and powerful and the well-educated, but the Reformation affected everyone, from the Pope in Rome to the peasant in the field. This lovely painting is by Federico Barucci and it's called the Madonna of the Cat. We're not saying that all painting was affected by the religious controversies of the day. This delightful painting with its soft edges and beautiful colours shows the holy family when the public weren't looking. They laugh and they play like any family. John the Baptist is actually holding up a goldfinch, which is a symbol of Christ, his cousin's passion but he's playing with it in front of a cat. Who does the cat represent? The devil? The reformers? But whatever is happening here, this is a happy domestic scene. This work is by our old friend Bronzino, and it's, it's the chapel of Eleonora de Toledo. Eleonora was the wife of Cosimo the Great of the Medici family and she was a generous patron of the newly founded Jesuit order set up to counter the Protestant Reformation. The chapel is planned around an image of the Virgin holding the physical body of Christ her son. Above, a beautiful Renaissance St. Michael strikes the devil, presumably representing the reformers. It has to be remembered that the wealth of the powerful Italian families often came from the patronages of popes and kings the very establishments the Protestants were attacking. 
over to the left of the main altar image is a cheerful Old Testament picture of the people of God collecting the manna in the wilderness. All of this is a reference to the Eucharist, the body of Christ foretold in Scripture through the bread from heaven. This is the Assumption of the Virgin in Parma Cathedral. It's another joyful image and it's by Correggio, who hailed from the north of Italy. Mary, whose faith represents the faith expected from the whole church, ascends into heaven, just like you will if you stick to the rules. You will also ascend on the day of judgment. And here's another rather jolly painting. This is the Martyrdom of Four Saints, also by Correggio. Look how the faithful die. They are not concerned about pain or mortality or the pleasures of this world. In pure bliss, they depart into the next life. And despite all your doubts, all your concerns and all your suffering, this is how you, the faithful, are to view death. But things could also get very dark, as can be seen in this painting by the master Titian. This martyrdom of St. Lawrence, a common subject in the late 16th century, so impressed Philip II of Spain that the king commissioned a second version. It is a painting full of darkness, full of dread, but with St. Lawrence triumphing over it all with his faith. Now, Spain hardly needed a counter-reformation. It considered itself more Catholic than Rome. And as can be seen in this El Greco, they had a taste for the apocalyptic. This painting is the breaking of the fifth seal. The book of Revelation says... When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had attained. But this is very much about the martyrdom of believers and the reward of resurrection they have to look forward to. Ecclesiastical portraits were also in vogue, as can be seen by this painting by Scipione Polzoni. It is a portrait of Cardinal Antoine Perrineau de Granville. He was one of Philip II's senior ministers. Polzoni is not a well-known painter, but he's one of exquisite skill. This one is in the National Gallery and it's actually on loan. And I do recommend when the National Gallery opens, you go and have a look at it. There are two wonderful portraits by Polzoni. And uh, for me, they were very much a revelation. This, in the permanent collection of the National Gallery, is also a bit of a revelation. It's a painting of Mary Magdalene, and it's by Giovanni Girolamo Savoldo. Savoldo is from the north of Italy near Venice, and here he is painting this creepy, dark Magdalene. It's painted before the Council of Trent, and it seems to hold some kind of mystery. What exactly is she thinking? as she looks out at us. Also by Savoldo is this Saint Jerome. It was painted even earlier in the century. And notice how Saint Jerome, like the Magdalene, fills the composition. He is focused on the crucifix with his Latin Vulgate Bible, the official Bible of the church, before him. He holds a rock in his hand as if he is about to harm himself mortifying his flesh. Let's go across to France, and this is The Last Judgment by Jean Cazin. This is a painting by a French Renaissance man, so much so that he rejected the influence of the Fontainebleau school and looked to Dürer and da Vinci instead. And yet we see a last judgment where the classical city represents Babylon, and Christ is sending his angels to judge the citizens. And here is The Mystery of the Passion of Christ by Antonio Campi. This was commissioned by the Bishop of Milan. 
campy fused mannerism with the Lombardi style he was based in Italy. This is a medieval didactic painting rendered in the mannerist style. Different stations in the passion story are illustrated, but the promise of the heavenly choir for Christ and his followers hovers in the background. When we look at these dark counter-reformation paintings, we might sometimes ask, what side were the Italian painters on? This is by the studio of Jacopo Bassano, and it's the purification of the temple. This cleansing of the temple could easily be an attack on the corruption in the church. The bearded man on the left is believed to be Titian, and if so, then could it be an attack on the relationship he had with popes and kings? But this period didn't just influence painting, it also influenced garden design as well. And here we have the palace garden designed and built by Count Pierre Francesco Orsini. It was built in the last three decades of Orsini's life, and it was rediscovered in the mid-20th century by no other than Salvador Dali. Orsini was a melancholy character, especially after the death of his wife. He retreated from the world in the second half of the 16th century to build this garden. It has classical features and ideas inspired by the Far East, but some see it almost as a memorial garden to the end of the Renaissance. This feature was supposed to be for picnicking, but it is more like an image from a medieval painting of a place for the damned. I'd like to now turn to someone who I believe was the greatest counter-reformation painter, and that was the Venetian painter Tintoretto. And here we have his self-portrait as a young man he painted when he was 30 years old. Tintoretto was his nickname due to the fact that his father was a dyer. He has been described as a demonic painter. His drama and dark fury was seen around the 19th century as unsettling, and some viewed him as possessed. In reality, he was small in stature and of calm disposition. He was a family man and quite pious. Two of his daughters became nuns. His great desire was to communicate his faith to the common man, people from the kind of background he came from. Hence his paintings are full of action, which some have dismissed as melodrama. This painting is Saint Rock administering to the plague victims. Saint Rock was a local saint, and Venice was a place associated with plague. Being a seaport, it was often the first place to be infected by plagues from around the world. It had its own quarantine island to help prevent the spread of plague, and it was one such plague that killed off his once master and bitter rival, Titian. Here we have the miraculous rescue of a Christian slave by Saint Mark and it's an important painting for Tintoretto because of its bold and unusual placing of Saint Mark coming into the top of the painting, a bit like Superman. It was produced for the Schooler Grand. Now, the Schooler were basically like rotary clubs. They were professional bodies of influential pillars of society in Venice, but they had a very much a very religious sort of background to them. And by doing this painting, it really did put Tintoretto on the map. This painting is the presentation of the Virgin. And here the story of the Virgin is embellished with an image showing her being recognized as a holy woman by the priests of pagan Egypt. It has the appearance of a stage set together with magnificent costumes. And look at how many women are represented in different stages of motherhood. She is the mother of the faith. This wonderful crucifixion, which is over 40 foot wide, an inscription identifies Tintoretto as a member of the Scuola Grand di San Rocco in Venice. However, his membership was opposed by many, as he was a rebellious figure who often went against authority. We have here another crucifixion painted three years later. Here the artist brings us closer into the group of disciples that stood at the foot of the cross. We are not spectators anymore. And in the background, that row of spears and halberds, they look rather German. Is this the Protestant armies about to invade? 
Our next painting I'd like to look at is The Finding of the Body of St. Mark, and I consider this one of the strangest paintings in the world. You may remember that St. Mark is the patron saint of Venice, and the basilica was built to house the remains of the saint. These were lost during the building project. Depicted here is a very odd story where the resurrection body of St. Mark shows people where his body, his physical dead body, has been hidden. And at the same time, he's also curing a demon-possessed man. I, I actually find this painting, uh, the only way I can describe it is it, 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 it reminds me of surrealism. It reminds me of the proto-surrealism of the Italian artist Di Chirico. Um, the strange space that it's set in and this strange subject matter. I, 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 I find this one of the uh, most entrancing, odd paintings in the whole world of art. This painting here, also in the, um, the, the same series uh, as, as the previous, is the removal of the body of St. Mark. And this was part of the decorations for the Scuola Grand di San Marco. It shows the Christians of Alexandria taking advantage of a storm so that they can remove the body of St. Mark from a pyre on which pagans were going to burn it. Here we have a detail of a painting which was painted for the Scuola called Paradise, and this is only one half of it. For centuries, it was the largest canvas ever painted at 22 meters wide, but it shows the promise of keeping to the Catholic faith, of being eventually with the blessed in heaven, with the great and the good, the saints, the bishops, the kings, all of those who we know are in heaven. Do you know that you're going to be in heaven? Here we have now the final self-portrait of Tintoretto painted when he was 70 years old. When we started this course we saw how art in the medieval world was mostly in the service of the church. It was didactic and often lacked inventiveness. It did not explore anything outside what the church wanted to discuss. It didn't explore the world around us. With the Renaissance that all changed, people were looking at the classical world before Christ and saw the world around them as a place of discovery and inspiration. But with the Counter-Reformation, art was once more in the employ of the church, and it would take another hundred years to shake that off in the 18th century Enlightenment. But now, the Counter-Reformation would lead Europe into the Baroque age of the 17th century.